Hello everyone. The topic of this lecture is hypothesis testing. There are five required data sets for this lecture and you can find them on Canvas. Before we start talking about hypothesis testing, let me illustrate the topic with a simple example. Airlines are very interested in the weight and the weight distribution of their passengers and cargo. Usually, they have a very good idea about the weight of cargo because they can weigh it before it gets loaded onto the plane. But when it comes to the weight of passengers, things get a bit more complicated. Airlines must rely on estimates from various institutions. In Europe, there is the European Aviation Safety Agency, which publishes standard passenger rate, weights. A female passenger is assumed to weigh 146.6 pounds, a male passenger is assumed to weigh 186.5 pounds, and a child under the age of 12 is assumed to weigh 67.7 pounds. In 2017, the Finnish airline Finnair asked passengers to step on a scale before boarding a flight to better understand their payload. Evidence suggested that business class passengers are heavier than passengers in economy. Passengers in, win in the winter are heavier than passengers in the summer due to difference in clothing. Note that when the BBC article was published, by the way, you can find this article by clicking on the link, Finnair had collected data from 180 volunteers. What Finnair did was a hypothesis test. A hypothesis is a statement about a parameter taking on a particular value. If you think back about the Finnair example, the hypothesis was that a female passenger weighs 146.6 pounds. That would be formulated as the null hypothesis. A hypothesis test is a procedure to verify the null hypothesis based on a random sample. In the Finnair example, that random sample would have been the 180 passengers. Note that we never accept the null hypothesis, but we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is very similar to the guilty versus not guilty verdict in courts. We do not have an innocent verdict. The opposite of the null hypothesis is labeled HA, sometimes also H1. In this lecture, we are going to look at various hypothesis tests. The first video focuses on one sample test or also one group test. We are going to look at the population mean with unknown variance and population proportions. Concepts learned from the confidence interval lecture will be helpful. In the second video, we are going to look at two sample tests. For two sample tests, we have two different samples or two different groups, and we compare whether the two groups are similar or different. We are going to look again at population proportions, population means, and we are also going to look at so-called paired difference tests. Note that statistics textbooks often include population mean with known variance. I believe that this is highly unlikely that this is a highly unlikely situation, and we are going to skip this. Now, before I get into the various hypothesis tests, let me illustrate graphically what we are going to do. So, take the Finnair example. Here, we are interested in the weight of passengers, and we are collecting a sample, and let's assume that we are interested in the weight of female passengers. Then. Our hypothesis, H0, would be that the weight of female passengers is equal to 146.6 pounds. The alternative hypothesis is that the weight is different from 146.6 pounds. Now, think about this the following way. We have our hypothesized value here of 146.6 pounds. 
And when we collect data, we are going to obtain a distribution of different passenger weights. Now, those passenger weights are going to be random. And it is normal to assume that there will be variation around the mean value. Now, the question is, when we are collecting passenger weights, and suppose we are getting a weight, an average weight of 150 pounds for passengers, then the question is, based on the distribution, how likely is it to get an average weight in our sample of 150 pounds given that the, that the uh, null hypothesis is that it is 146 pounds. Suppose that the distribution we get from our sample is such that we have 150 pounds here and that this is very far away from the hypothesized value of 146 based on the standard deviation of our distribution. Suppose that it is such that the probability of getting a higher sample of 150, of 150 pounds is just say 1%. Okay? What this was, would suggest is that based on our sample of 150 pounds, based on our um, sample mean of 150 pounds, there's only a 1% chance that we are actually getting values above that sample. That would be an indication that the true mean of our female passengers is not going to be 146 pounds. Now compare this with a situation where we have again a mean, a hypothesized mean of 146 pounds. We have our distribution. But suppose that the variance of this distribution or of the sample we are getting is such that the 150 pounds, our sample mean, is right here. Meaning that there's an extremely high chance, say all this area here, and suppose this area is 40%. Here we are in a situation where the 150 pounds is actually not that far off from the 146 pounds because there's a 40% chance that we would actually find a higher mean sample of 150 pounds. So in the second case, we would have evidence that our null hypothesis of 146.6 pounds is actually correct. Now, throughout the lecture, we are going to make multiple examples and this concept will become clear. In order to conduct a hypothesis test, you have to follow four steps. The first step is to formulate your hypothesis. The null hypothesis can be either one-sided or two-sided. In a two-sided test, you are interested in whether your parameter deviates in either direction from your hypothesized value. Suppose you are interested in a machine that fills half-gallon containers with milk. A two-sided hypothesis test would test if the fillings deviate in either direction, that is, fills the container with more or less than half a gallon of milk. In a one-sided test, you are interested in deviations in one direction. Think back about the container of milk and the percentage of saturated fat indicated on the nutritional label. Here, it would be important that the actual percentage does, does not exceed the indicated percentage. You would test this with a one-sided test. The second step is to set the significance level called alpha. In general, it is set to 1%, 5%, or 10%. It indicates the probability that you reject the null hypothesis, even if it is true in reality. In a third step, you calculate the test statistic. This is going to be the core of the hypothesis test. 
Based on the test statistic, you are going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. In order to do so, you have to know what the critical value is. The critical value represents the point where you either reject or fail to reject H0. The p-value is the probability of observing the parameter given the null hypothesis. Smaller p-values represent evidence against the null hypothesis H0. Note that the equality is always part of the null hypothesis. When conducting a hypothesis test, you can make errors. Now, before getting into the errors, let me talk about when you are actually correct. So think about the null hypothesis, this column here, that in reality, H0 is true or H0 is false. Now, on top here, you have the researcher who fails to reject H0 or rejects H0. In, if in reality H0 is true and you as the researcher based on your data reject H0, then you have made the correct decision. If in reality H0 is false and you as the researcher reject H0, then again you have drawn the right conclusion. Now suppose that H0 in reality is correct, but that you simply have a very bad sample, or a sample that can be considered an outlier. So H0 is true, but you reject H0, then you have conducted a type 1 error. Note that the significance level of the test alpha is the probability that you are conducting, that you are uh, doing a type 1 error. A type 2 error occurs if H0 is actually false and you are failing to reject H0, then you have done a type 2 error. Suppose, think back about the example from FinAir, and suppose that the weight is 146.6 pounds, and that is actually true in reality. Think about this as the value of the population. Now, if you are rejecting H0 in this case, because say you have 150, you have a sample mean of 150 pounds and you're rejecting H0, then you're conducting a type 1 error. The opposite occurs if in reality the population weight of passengers is different from 146 pounds, but based on your sample you are failing to reject the hypothesis, then you would have a type 2 error. Now, before I was talking about the one-sided versus two-sided test. So this is illustrated here. In a two-sided test, you have a hypothesized value and you are interested in deviations to either direction, in either direction. Here, I have drawn a normal distribution and the gray shaded area here represents in total 5%. You have 2.5% on the left side and you have 2.5% on the right side. So in total 5%. If you're doing a one-sided test and you're testing at the 5% significance level, then you only have the 5% either on the left side or on the right side. Now, each statistical software provides a p-value. The p-value is the lowest level of significance at which the null hypothesis can be rejected. The lower the p-value, the more unlikely is your hypothesis, more specifically your null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis H0 is rejected if the p-value is smaller than the significance level. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence against H0 being true. Note that, note that you only have to compare the p-value to your level of significance. If you have set up the hypothesis correctly, and we will see this in R, if the p-value is below your level of significance, then you are rejecting H0. Now we are going to look at one sample or one group hypothesis tests. 
First, we are going to look at hypothesis tests of the mean with unknown variance. If the variance is unknown, or if the population variance is unknown, this requires to use the t-distribution given the following test statistic. We have x bar, which is our sample mean. We have mu, which is our hypothesized mean. We have s as the sample standard deviation. And we have n as the sample size. Note that this entire expression should look very similar to what we have seen for the confidence intervals. Now, suppose that you are the engineer for the local water company and you are concerned about the daily water pressure in the city's pipes. Too much pressure may burst pipes, whereas too little pressure may cause customer complaints. Now, in this case, we are going to conduct a two-sided hypothesis test because we are interested in deviations to either side. Suppose that the regulation requires a water pressure of 50 psi, or pounds per square inch. You collect a sample of 30 daily water pressures and note that you can find this data set in waterpressure.csv and that the sample mean and the sample standard deviation are 51.78 psi as the sample mean and the sample standard deviation is 3.389. So following the steps of the hypothesis test, we are first going to formulate the null hypothesis H0 and the alternative hypothesis HA. We have H0 as the water pressure being at 50 psi, and the alternative hypothesis is that it is different from 50 psi. Note that this two-sided test is indicated by the not equal sign. Okay? We are setting the significance level at 5% or the alpha at 0 0.05. Then we have to calculate the test statistic where we have 51.788. This is the sample mean, x bar, minus the hypothesized value, 50, divided by the sample standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size and we get a test statistic of 2.8895. Now, in order to interpret this value, this test statistic, we have to know what the critical value is for our t-distribution, where we have 29 degrees of freedom. Note that this critical value for the test statistic is 2.045. Now, let me visualize what's going on here. Let me draw again a t-distribution. So this is our t-distribution. And note that we have 29 degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, the critical value, since our level of significance is 5%, what we are interested in is, and it is a two-sided hypothesis test, we want to know what is the value here and here that leaves 2.5% in the tails. So here we have 2.5% on the right side, and we have 2.5% on the left side. So it turns out that in our example, the critical value is 2.045. Right? So what this means is the point here is 2.045, and we have negative 
for five on the left side. Now our hypothesized mean, or H0, is that the mean is equal to 50, and with the alternative hypothesis that the mean is different from 50. Now, our test statistic indicates that it is 2.8895. So the test statistic is equal to 2.8895. Now compare the 2.8895 compare it to the critical value. And you see that our test statistic is to the right of our critical value. Suppose that our test statistic is right here. Okay. What this means is that based on our hypothesized value, it is extremely unlikely to observe the sample mean that we have received. So if the true pressure in the, in the city's water pipes was indeed 50 PSI, based on the sample mean and also the sample uh, standard deviation, it is extremely unlikely to observe the mean of 51.788. Hence, we reject H0, and there is evidence that the water pressure is different from 50 PSI. Now, let us illustrate this example, the calculations, in R. Note that I have already loaded the data sets on the right-hand side here, and we are going to work with the data set water pressure. In the first step, we are going to calculate the number of observations in our data set. This will make it more useful later. So n, where n represents the number of observations, is equal to n row water pressure PSI. Actually, it is just water pressure. So we have 30 observations. Now we calculate x bar. x bar is equal to mean water pressure PSI. And we get our mean of 51.788. Then we calculate the standard deviation. Here we can use the command SD. And we find that the standard deviation is the 3.389. Now then we are going to calculate the test statistic. Or let's just call it T stat. And that would be X bar minus 50 divided by the standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. And we get the t-statistic of 2.8895. Now the question is, what is the critical value? Remember, the critical value in this case can be thought of as follows. We have our T distribution. And we are interested in the value that leaves 2.5% on the left side and 2.5% on the right side. 
So we are interested in the value, the cutoff point here, that leaves 2.5% here and 2.5% here. And note again that this is a T distribution with 29 degrees of freedom. So in order to calculate the critical value, let's just call it critical, you have to use the command QT. Remember that the Q refers to the fact that you know the probability underneath the area and the T refers to the T distribution. And the two cutoff points would be, would the two probabilities would be 2.5% on the left side and 2.5% on the right side. So you have to enter the 2.5% on the right side. You have to enter that as 0.975. And you also have to enter the degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom are 29. So the, you can see now that the two critical values are negative 2.05 and positive 2.05. In the context of the graph that we have here, this means that we have negative 2.05 here, and we have 2.05 on the right side. Right. Now, since our test statistic of 2.88 is inside those 5% those areas, we reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Note that you can also calculate the p-value manually by doing the following. You can type in p-value is equal to 1 minus pt, the test statistic, with 29 degrees of freedom or n minus 1. And note that you have to multiply this by 2 since it is a two-sided test. And you get a p-value of 0 0.0072. What this means is that given the hypothesized mean of 50 psi, the average that we are observing of 51.78 is extremely unlikely to observe. Now, of course, this is a very long procedure, but fortunately, you can use the command t-test in R, and all you have to do is you have to type in t-test, parenthesis open, water pressure, PSI, comma, and then you have to insert the, the hypothe hypothesized mean, which is mu equals to 50. Then if you execute this, or if you run this, you get the following output. Note that it tells you your data, the water pressure. It tells you the t-value or the t-statistic, which we have seen before, the 2.8895. This is what we have calculated manually here. It gives you the degrees of freedom, which is equal to 29. And it also gives you the p-value of 0 0.007232. This is what we have calculated here manually as well. Now note, and this is extremely important, R formulates the results in terms of the alternative hypothesis and not the null hypothesis. In this case, it says the true mean is not equal to 50. So what this means is that the alternative hypothesis is that the true mean is not equal to 50. The null hypoth hypothesis is that the true mean is equal to 50. Okay. So what I mentioned before is that if you have set up the t-test, the function t-test correctly, 
you only have to look at the p-value to decide whether you are rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. We said that we are going to test at the 5% level. The p-value is below 5% and hence we are rejecting the null hypothesis. Note that you have the output of this of this uh, result also in your slides on page 14. Now let us consider a one-sided test. Consider the scores from a graduate MPA class which has 18 students. Note that you can find the data in the file mpa.csv. You will see that the sample mean is 69% or 69 points and the sample standard deviation is 21.15. Note that the sample standard deviation is very large. Now suppose that you are interested in a null hypothesis that the mean scores is actually 80% or more. Note that the bigger equal sign here represents a one-sided hypothesis. Now, when we are doing the one-sided hypothesis, then we are interested in 5% on one side. So, in this case, we have the following. We have our distribution. And we have a hypothesized mean of 80%. Now here we have H0. Is that it's bigger than 80%. Bigger than 80. So now we are only interested in deviation to one side. So in this case, we calculate the test statistic as follows. We take the mean that we find, the sample mean, minus the hypothesized value, divided by the standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size, and we get a test statistic of negative 2.2066. So in this case, we have our test statistic, which is negative 2.2. Okay. Now the question is whether this negative 2.2, whether it falls within the 5% range where we would reject the null hypothesis. And hence what we need to do is we need to know the critical value. So let us switch to R to actually make the calculations. Note that I have already loaded the MPA dataset. And so what we are going to do is we are going to calculate the sample size. And we know that the sample size is now 18. We are going to calculate the average score say mean MPA, dollar sign MPA, the mean is 69%, and the standard deviation is 21.15. Okay. Now the test statistic, we said that we are going to take the mean, x bar, minus the hypothesized value, divided by the standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size and we get the test statistic of 
negative 2.206. Now, in order to determine the critical value, we are again, again going to use the function qt. Okay. But now we are only interested at 5% 5, 5 on one side. So in this case, we are going to say qt 0 0.05 for n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And hence, that critical value is negative 1.74. What this means is that our critical value is right here, negative 1.74. That leaves 5% on to the left of this value. So we have five, the shaded area here is 5%. And hence, since our test statistic falls within this area, we are going to reject the null hypothesis that the mean is bigger than 80%. Note that you have to be very, very careful of how you enter this now, this one-sided test, into R. You have to type in test, t-test. You have to say which data you are interested in, so the MPA data. You say that the mu is equal to 80. And then you have to let R know that you are doing a one-sided test. Now, what is extremely important here is that you, are in, <clears throat> that you are entering the alternative hypothesis. Now, the null hypothesis in this case is that the score is greater than 80, and hence the alternative hypothesis is that it is less than 80. So in this case, what you have to enter here is less because you are formulating it as the null hypothesis, as the alternative hypothesis, and not the null hypothesis. When you enter this, you can now see the output that says the t-test, the t test statistic, is negative 2.2066. We have 17 degrees of freedom. And the p-value is now 0 0.02069. Since the p-value is below the 5% that we are interested in, we are rejecting the null hypothesis. And also note that it says the alternative hypothesis is that the true mean is less than 80, whereas the null hypothesis is that the true mean is greater than 80. Note that you can also calculate the p-value manually here by typing p-value is equal to pt, the test statistic, and the degrees of freedom of 17. And you get the p-value of 0 0.0206, which is exactly what we have here. Now, to interpret this p-value, what it means is the following. So let me draw again a distribution here. This distribution is identical to the one above. Now, in this case, we have had a test statistic of negative 2.2. The p-value is the probability that is to the left of this value. So in this case, the p-value is 
0 0.02, let's say 0 0.021, which means that the area that I marked here in red is 2.1%, which is smaller than the 5% that we are interested in. So the water pressure and also the MPA example are the methods to calculate a one-sided and a two-sided hypothesis test with R. Now let us turn our attention to a hypothesis test about a population proportion. Very similar to the confidence interval about a proportion, we can now use the normal distribution instead of the T distribution. This is why I'm going to use the Z here. The test statistic for a proportion is taking the average proportion based on your sample minus the hypothesized proportion divided by the standard error. Okay. Now, for this example, we are going to use data from the General Social Survey, GSS, from 2016. In that year, they asked respondent, respondents whether they are using any social media. Out of 1,366 respondents, 30.97% indicated that they are using Instagram. Now, let us calculate two possible hypothesis tests for this example and assume that Instagram claims that one-third of Americans are using their services. So we have the average proportion of 30.97, we have the sample size of 1,366, and under age zero, the proportion is that one-third of the population is using Instagram. So we can calculate the test statistic, and we can find that the test statistic is negative 1.8914. Now, if this is a two-sided test, we know that for the standard normal distribution, 1.96 indicates the borders or the cutoff points that leaves one. 2.5% on the left side and 2.5% on the right side of the tail. So if you represent this visually, we have again our distribution, but this time it is actually the normal distribution. Okay, so we have the bell curve and we know that at negative 1.96 and at 1.96 that this leaves 5%, uh, sorry, 2.5% on the left side and 2.5% on the right side and that we have in here, we have 95%. The advantage of doing a hypothesis test for a proportion is that you do not have to look at the t-distribution and you always know that for a two-sided test at the 5% level, that the cutoff points or the critical values are always going to be negative 1.96 and 1.96. based on the test that we have done, based on the test statistic that we have calculated, we have negative 1.89, meaning that the test statistic is about here. And hence, we are failing to reject the null hypothesis that one third of users are actually using Instagram. Now, we can also do those calculations in R. We can use the same command as before. We type t.test social media Instagram. Note that you also have data about Facebook. And we say that the hypothesized mean is that one-third 
uh, using Instagram. If we execute this, we see that the T statistic is negative 1.89. This is what we have calculated also manually. And that the P value is just slightly above the 5%. And hence, we are failing to reject the null hypothesis. So there is evidence that one third of respondents are using Instagram. Now, we can also calculate a one-sided test. Suppose that Instagram claims that more than one third of Americans are using Instagram. In this case, you have to specify that you're doing a one-sided test by saying that the alternative is equal to greater. Okay, uh, sorry, it, it's equal to less. Because remember, the null hypothesis is that it is more than one-third, and hence you have to specify the alternative hypothesis for R that it is less. So now when you execute the results, note that the T statistic hasn't changed, but that now the P value is below 5%. What this means is that we reject the null hypothesis that more than one third of Americans are using Instagram. Again, if you have set up the hypothesis test in R correctly or in any other software, you only have to look at the p-value and compare that p-value to your significance level. If the p-value is smaller than your significance level, in this case 2.9% is smaller than 5%, you're rejecting the null hypothesis. Now, let me visualize this one last time. Suppose that you have a distribution and think about that it doesn't matter about whether this is now a T distribution or a normal distribution. It is valid uh, for both cases. And let us look at a two-sided hypothesis test. And for a two-sided hypothesis test, you have your critical values, say here and here, and those critical values leave 2.5% on the right side and 2.5% on the left side. Now, let me shade this with red. And let me shade the 95% in the middle. Let me shade this with green. Okay. Now, you have your critical values. Uh, you have them here. And you have them here. Those are the critical values. So now the important part is if your test statistic is in this area, you reject H0. If your test statistic is in this area, you fail to reject H0. Okay? Now keep this picture in mind 
for everything related to hypothesis testing. Okay. Think about, based on your sample, if you get an, an extreme value that is in the tails of the distribution, what this means is that your hypotho hypothesized value is probably not correct. Whereas if you get a sample mean or a sample proportion that is falling in the middle, then there is evidence that your hypothesis is correct. Now in this part of the lecture, we are going to look at two sample or two group hypothesis tests. Basically what it is is the following. Suppose you have two samples and you would like to know whether those samples are similar or different. In order to find out whether those samples are different or similar, you have to do a two-group hypothesis test. In this lecture, we are just going to focus on the means of the difference. Now, <clears throat> consider the following. What we have seen during the last lecture, when we are just looking at one sample, is that, for example, that we are looking at, say, for example, water pressure, where we think about the water pressure being 50 psi. We take a sample and we hypothesize that the water pressure is 50 psi. We take the sample, we calculate the mean, and then we conduct a hypothesis test based on that sample. The two group hypothesis test is slightly different. Suppose you have water pressure from two different cities and you would like to know whether the water pressure in both cities is identical. Hence, you would conduct a two-group hypothesis test where your null hypothesis would be that, say, the water pressure in city one is equal to the water pressure in city two. Okay? And the alternative hypothesis would be that the water pressure in city one is different than the water pressure in city two. Now, when we compare means between two different groups, there's a slight difference compared to the one group hypothesis test, in the sense that we have to know something about the distribution of the water pressure in the first city and the water pressure in the second city. In one type of hypothesis test, we can assume that both water pressures, or the variance of both water pressures in both cities is equal. So that the variance in city one is equal to the variance in city two. Note that this refers to the population variance. Or in this case, it's actually the standard deviation. So this is what I have indicated with those two graphs. So we have city one here, and we have city two here. And when we assume that the standard deviation is the same in both cities, then the distribution around the mean is identical, or we assume that it is identical. However, it could also be the case that for some reason, we think that the population variance in city one, or the standard deviation in city one, is different than the standard deviation in city two. And again, this refers to the population variance, or population uh, standard deviation. Okay. Now, this is what I have illustrated here in the bottom graph, where for city one, the variance is very small. This is indicated that the mass of the distribution is around mu1. Whereas in city 2, there is a much larger variance. Okay. So here we would have that the variance or the standard deviation in city 1 is smaller than the standard deviation in city 2. Okay. Now we will see that when we implement this in R, that the difference is going to be very small in terms of p-value, but it is still something to keep in mind. 
so what we are going to see in this lecture is again we are looking at a hypothesis test on the difference between two means and in the first case we are going to assume that the variance between the two means is equal. This could be, for example, if you have a pretest and a post-test on a particular pro population. Now, the advantage of assuming that the variance between the two means is equal, or the, between the two populations is equal, is that you only have to estimate one variance. Okay? Now, if you think that the means of the two populations are independent, or that the variance is independent, then you actually have to estimate two means. This is what you see here. Okay? Now, the next couple of slides are going to be technical, but do not worry about it too much, since we are going to implement this in R, and it's going to be much easier. So, in the first case, when we actually assume that we have two populations with equal variance, then we only have to estimate one variance. This is what, what is indicated in the top line here, where we are estimating what is called the pooled variance. Think about this as the average value between the sample variance uh, of group 1 and the sample variance of group 2. Then, very much like before, we have a test statistic and we will see that we compare this test statistic to a critical value. In the case where we have unequal population variance between the two groups, then we are still going to calculate a test statistic, but we do not have a pooled variance. Okay? Also note that the degrees of freedom are going to be calculated slightly different. And we will see that the degrees of freedom are not going to be an, uh, an integer number anymore. Now, let us illustrate this concept using R. So, for this exercise, we are going to use the data that is in Ohio.csv. In this data set, what you have is you have 607 Ohio school districts and you have information about the enrollment of students, you have information about the median income in the school district, and you have information about the score of the school district. Think about the score as the achievement in the school district or the quality of the school district. What we are going to do in this exercise is to test the hypothesis whether the instructional quality or the score is different depending on the size of the school or the size of the school district. Note that in your homework you're going to do the same but you're looking at median income. Whether school districts with lower median income perform as well as school districts with high median income. So in the first step what we're going to do is we are creating two three different groups for small schools with students below a thousand, medium schools, schools that have between a thousand and three thousand students, and large schools where those represent schools with more than three thousand students. So let's call it uh, Ohio School S for small. Those are all the schools with enrollment of less than 1,000. Then we are going to look at large schools, which have more than 3,000 students enrolled in them. And then we are going to also look at medians, medium schools, which have between 1,000 and 3,000 students 
this should be an AND. So now we have created those three groups. And now we are going to test the hypothesis that the small schools perform as well as the large schools. To do this, we are going to use the command t.test. This is similar to the one group hypothesis test. And we are saying that the small schools, the score, this is the first group. Then we have to enter the second group, which is the large. And we are going to say that the variance is going to be equal. What this assumes is that the variance between the large schools and the small schools is equal. When we execute the test, then what we find is that we have a t-value of 1.6. We have 297 degrees of freedom, and we have a p-value of 0.1. So if we are testing at the 5% significance level, or even at the 10% significance level, we are rejecting, uh, we are failing to reject the null hypothesis. Note that the alternative hypothesis here is that the true difference in means is not equal to zero meaning that the null hypothesis is that the true difference in means is equal to zero. In this case, we have evidence that there is no difference in performance between large schools and small schools. We can also test this again, assuming that the variance between the small school and the large school. Large schools are unequal. And what you find is that you are coming up with the same conclusion in the sense that the p value is 0.1183, which even if we test at the 10% level, we are failing to reject the null hypothesis. Note that the interpretation of the hypothesis test is identical in the two group versus the one group example. You are only looking at the p-value and you are looking at whether the p-value is below your level of significance. The last topic I would like to talk about are paired difference tests. Now a paired different test is necessary when you have the same object in group one than you have in group two. Think back about the Ohio school example. A school which is in the first group of the small enrollment is not going to be in the second group of the large enrollment schools. However, you may have the case where you have the same object in the first group and in the second group. That's when you, that's when you use a paired difference test. Now consider the following example. You can have a textbook that you can purchase either online or in a bookstore. Now, prices exist, exist for both purchasing options, and you may be interested whether there's a difference between prices online and prices in a bookstore. You're conducting a hypothesis test based on the difference between paired values. Paired means of the same book in this case. Consider the following example. Here I have five books that are identical and I have prices online and I have prices in a bookstore. So for example, the first book, assume this is a history textbook, costs $10.20 online and the same book costs $11.40 in a bookstore. You can also think about a more expensive book where Online, the book costs $236.75, and in the bookstore, it costs $247.20. Now, you can conduct a paired 
test, paired difference test between those two examples. And what you have to do is again, you have to use the command ttest and you say online, comma, stored, first group, second group, and you have to tell R that there is a match between the pairs. And you do this by saying paired equals true. And when you execute this, you now see that the p-value is 0 0.1062, which means you are failing to reject the hypothesis that there is a difference between the prices in the online store and the prices in the, in the bookstore. Note that you also have the difference, the mean of the difference is about a $6. Now note that this is also a very small example. So let me move to a slightly more complicated example. Here, here you have data about the fuel economy of various compact cars. Now the story behind this example is that when automatic transmissions started, it was said that cars with an automatic transmission have a lower fuel economy than cars with a manual transmission. The reason there was that automatic transmission missions are sluggish and they are also heavier than manual transmission and hence they're adding to the weight of the car and hence reducing the fuel efficiency. Now in this example I would like to test the claim based on cars from the model year 1995 and cars from the model year 2015. What I want to know is whether the difference in fuel economy is present for 1995 cars and whether it is present for 2015 cars. Note that in this example I'm only focusing on compact cars. So what I have done, I have taken data from the EPA fuel economy guide and I just looked at compact cars and I picked up every car that is offered in Automatic, with automatic transmission and with manual transmission. So for example, if you take this 1994 Alfa Romeo model 164, it has a three liter engine and it has front wheel drive. So everything is identical about the car except that it is offered with automatic transmission and with manual transmission. And the same is true for this 1995 Audi A6 and so on. Now here we have Two groups, group one is all the cars with automatic transmission and group two is all the cars with the manual transmission. And I have it for two years, for 1995 and 2015. Basically what we can test here is whether transmission technology or automatic transmission technology has advanced over the 20 years and whether to see if the difference in fuel economy in 1995 is present and whether it is present in 2015. Note, and this is very important, we are not comparing the fuel efficiency in 1995 to the fuel efficiency in 2015, but we are comparing automatic fuel, we are comparing automatic transmission fuel economy and manual transmission fuel economy for 95 and then for 2015. First thing you have to do is you have to separate you have to create two groups, one for 95 cars and one for 2015 cars. And let's just say CC for compact cars 1995. And you are subsetting the cars. So here we only have now, we have 34 observations of 1995 cars. We do the same for 2015. And then we are running a paired difference test for 95 and a paired difference test for 2015. So we type t test cc 1995. 
automatic. That's the first group. CC 9095 manual is the second group. And we tell R that we are looking at pairs. So pairs is paired equals true. And we do the same for the 2015 cars. And then we execute those two hypothesis tests. Note that the null hypothesis here is that there is no difference in fuel economy between an automatic car and a manual transmission car. We see that for 1995, since the p-value is extremely small, we are rejecting the null hypothesis. Hence, there is evidence that cars with an automatic transmission indeed had lower fuel efficiency than cars with a manual transmission. However, we fail to reject the same for cars of 2015. This means that the tr technology in automatic transmission, transmissions has increased sufficiently such that there is no difference between the two, the two transmission types. And this is what you can use a paired hypothesis test for.